John chapter 20. Uh, last time in Luke chapter 9, we, we talked about uh, Jesus calling the disciples and everyone, for that matter, to follow him. You remember uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 said, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. So now let's fast forward a bit from where we are in Luke. Jesus, after being resurrected from the dead, after revealing himself to Mary Magdalene, after showing himself to the two guys on the road to Emmaus, who testified as well as Mary had to, these, uh, to the others that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. But they didn't believe, or told. Jesus appears to all of them behind shut and secured doors. He reveals himself to them. He's telling them to be at peace. And the disciples rejoiced to see him. And after telling them that the Father had sent him, he was sending them. And so after telling his followers that he was sending them out, just as God the Father had sent him out, and then he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You know, none of us will argue that Jesus was sent here on a mission. God the Father had a specific plan, a specific purpose, a specific calling for Jesus. I don't think anyone here would dispute this fact. And the heart of that mission was the salvation of the world, the salvation of mankind, restoring man, restoring us to a right standing with Almighty God, our Creator. Jesus tells his disciples, his followers, just as the Father has sent him on this mission, he would now be sending them. He would now be sending us on a mission. You know, often you'll hear pastors or preachers talking about a, a calling, you know, a called by God to fill the role they're in. Uh, now, we don't l literally mean God called us on the telephone. Uh, we mean God impressed upon us. He impressed upon our hearts the direction that we're following. And God does this through His written Word, the Bible. God does this through prayer as we listen to that still small voice. And God will often speak to us through others and through our circumstances. There's no doubt in my mind that God has called me to lead, uh, or has called me and led me, directed me, to be the senior pastor of this fellowship. In fact, the thought that God has not called me to this has really never even entered my mind. But you know, before that, God called me to be an elder in the church, and before that, God called me to help with the youth, and God called me to be a part of a small group, and God called me to lead a small group, and God had called Jill and I to host a small group in our home, and God has called me to serve in children's ministry. God has called me to share my uh, faith or the gospel with friends and with family, with co-workers, and sometimes even strangers. And every one of those callings is a supporting role of that one single mission that the Father sent Jesus here for, the salvation of man, restoring each one back to a right standing with God. What I'm telling you is, God's calling is not just on pastors and preachers. Jesus has a calling for every one of his disciples, for every one of his followers, for every Christian, for every one of us, every one of you. God has called. God has a calling for your life. Jesus is sending you just as he was sent to fulfill that mission, the salvation of man. You know, Jesus, he did the work, right? Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus provided the way for man to be restored back to God. But people need to know about the way. And for some reason, God has chosen us, His church, His followers, His believers, His Christians. He has chosen us, or He has called us to tell people, to show people, to lead and direct people to this way of salvation. We're not all called to be pastors. We're not all called to be elders. We're not all called to work with the children. We're not all called to lead worship. We're not all called to the tech team. We're not all called to be an usher or greeter or evangelist. But every one of us is called. 
Every one of us is sent by Jesus to help in this mission, the salvation of man. Make no mistake, you are called by God to help in this mission. God has a specific plan, a specific purpose, a specific calling in your life. If you're like me, you're probably thinking, well, how could God use a person like me? You know, I've done some things in the past. You might be thinking, I, I'm not proud of those things. And certainly, they're things that didn't make God proud. You know, I'm just not a good choice. If I was God, I certainly wouldn't pick a person like me. You know, Jesus himself, he picked the 12 apostles. And notice, he didn't pick the religious folks. He didn't pick government officials. He didn't even pick good, moral, law-abiding citizens. He, he picked regular folks. Many were fishermen. Matthew was the equivalent of an IRS agent. What do you think they were thinking when Jesus picked them and called them? The same thing. How, how could God use a person like me? I've done some things in the past, you know, I'm not proud of. I'm just not a good choice. You know, if I was God, I, I wouldn't pick a person like me. It's the same thing. God has shown us in his word by example after example that he does not call the equipped, but in fact, he equips those that he calls. When God does the equipping in us, who gets the glory? Well, God does. Who gets the credit for the work being done? God does. Look around this group. Would you, would you classify us as a, as a church of professionals striving to be righteous? Or a bunch of regular folks that God is equipping and using to do His work? And who gets the glory in that case? God does. Over the years, we've seen God equip people, family members, sons, daughters, uh, that have been lifted up in prayer for years and years. As Trish, we've seen folks finally respond to that call of God, and God equips them and works through them in amazing ways, and there is nowhere else for that glory to go but to God, because it is Him doing it. Every one of us is sent out by Jesus. Every one of us has been called to help in this mission, the salvation of mankind. Every one of us has a role to play in this. You know, one of the great, philosoph great questions of philosophy is what is the meaning of life, right? Well, this is the meaning of life. The Gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. That He has provided a way that man can be restored back to a right standing with God. That each person has the opportunity to accept this free gift of salvation. That is the meaning of life. Don't ever forget it. That's what our mission is all about. And God has a calling, a position for each one of us. You know, this isn't a football game where half the team sits on the bench. This is a war, and we are the army, and each one of us plays a vital role in the accomplishment of this mission that has been set before us. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So, what do we need to do? We need to start running around frantically, doing good deeds, striving to be religious, striving to make ourselves look righteous. No, that's exactly what the enemy wants us to do. Missions succeed when soldiers follow orders. Jesus has sent us. We're on a mission. And He has orders for us to follow. His orders. His plan. His strategy. So often we hear the order and we say, oh, no, you know, that's, that's really not my thing. I, I want to help, but not really in that way. You know, I'm just not interested in that. And I'm sure God's thinking, well, what do you think I am? I mean, you, don't you think I know how to use my own soldiers in the most effective way possible? Do you think I don't know how to use you with that personality I formed with those characteristics I shaped with those gifts that I created within you? Can any, any one of us count the number of hairs on our head? And including eyebrows and beards and for you bald guys and stuff growing out of your ears and necks. And God says He knows, right? 
He knows how many hairs. He's numbered the hairs. So that means God knows you better than you know you. Right? God knows you better than you know you. Or than I know me. So who are we to tell God what we are capable of? Or better yet, who are we to tell God what He is capable of doing through us? Are we going to put a limit on Him? You know, well, when you put it that way, it sounds crazy, right? Has God ever asked you to do something scary that scares you? Well, I hope so. Join the club. I, I can't think of one thing that God has asked me to do that wasn't scary. God never says it'll be easy, that it won't be scary. That uh, Do you think it's uh, easy for, a, since we're talking about a soldier, do you think it's easy for an 18-year-old to step off a plane in Iraq or wherever the next thing will happen, uh, wearing a flag jacket and a rifle in his hands? That's scary. We too are on a mission, and it's scary. But God has promised to provide all that we need to do whatever He is calling us to do. He has promised to equip us if we'll just trust Him and rely upon Him, following His leading, following His guiding. If we'll just trust Him. Trust. Faith. And where does that trust, where does that faith come from? In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we read, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing the Word of God. You're not going to hear if you're not listening. So are we listening? Are we reading God's Word daily? Or are we talking to God in prayer daily? If we're not, how are we going to have the faith to do what He's calling us to do? Faith comes from hearing His Word. Shoot, how are, how are we even going to know what He's asking us to do if we're not listening? The word faith, sometimes this word is used in place of the word religion. You know, like what faith do you subscribe to? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a step in faith. Believing God. Trusting God. In, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, we read, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I like how the NIV puts it. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sure and certain. So about the things hoped for, about the things that have not been seen, faith is sure. It's certain. About the things hoped for, the things not seen, faith is convinced, positive, confident, definite, unquestionable, undisputable, guaranteed. Guarantee. Where does that faith come from? Hearing the Word of God. You may say, Rob, well you said it wasn't easy to follow the calling of God. But what about for the apostles? You know, the ones that saw Jesus with their own eyes and walked with Him daily, eating meals and just hanging out. Certainly it was easy for them, right? Well again, let's fast forward a bit from where we are in Luke. Jesus, he's been resurrected from the dead. He's, after he's revealed himself to Mary Magdalene, he showed himself to these two guys on the road to Emmaus, who testified, and Mary testified to the others. We've seen him. We've seen him, that he's, he's risen from the dead. But we're told they didn't believe. Then Jesus appears to them behind shut doors, and he reveals himself to them, and he's tells them to be at peace, and the disciples rejoice to see Him. They believed after seeing them, Him. And then after telling them that the Father has sent Him, and He was sending them, and He breathes on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. And then in John chapter 20, verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to Him, we have seen the Lord. But He said to them, uh, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and, and I put my finger into the place of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas, one of the twelve apostles, 
He'd lived with Jesus 24-7 for three years, and even with the testimony of all the other disciples, Thomas refuses to believe. Where's his faith? Faith comes from hearing the Word of Jesus, the Word of God. Remember, Jesus many times prior to this, He had alluded to the fact that He would die and He would rise again on the third day. Many times He alluded to it, but He was crystal clear in Matthew, verse, Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. He says, And while they were gathered together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill Him, and He will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Jesus spoke this word of prophecy to them that he would die and then he would rise again on the third day. They heard something here because they were grieved. But they didn't really hear, did they? It seems like they heard the first part that Jesus would be killed. And so they grieved. But what about the second part? The miraculous part, the glorious part that Jesus would be raised on the third day. That's not something to grieve over. That's something to be excited about. So the disciples had heard these words of Jesus, but they didn't listen. They didn't comprehend. Man, I, I'm guilty of this. Uh, I'll be, we'll be watching TV, and Jill will tell me about something, and she'll be just about done telling me, and I'll look over at her and say, what, are you talking to me? And... Uh, or worse, she'll finish, and I'll, and I'll have no idea uh, that she had shared with me, usually, usually pertinent information, you know, until later I dropped the ball that I didn't even realize I was holding. Uh, Jill, she can be on her tablet, watching the TV show, having a text conversation, be talking to me all at the same time, and know what's going on with all of them. Uh, I hear it's called uh, multitasking. Uh, supposedly it's more common with women. Uh, I don't know, I really wasn't paying attention, but uh, for me, when the TV's on, it's, you know, oh, and my eyes glaze over and the blank look comes across the face. You know, it's the lights out, nobody's home. Maybe it's a man thing, I, I don't know. But apparently, Thomas and the others, they didn't really hear Jesus, or they didn't comprehend Jesus, or they didn't believe Jesus. Jesus said the words, but they went in one ear and out the other. They weren't really listening. They weren't comprehending. And what was the result? The result was lack of faith. Thomas Lee basically says to the others, I don't care what you say or what you think you saw. I don't believe it. And I'm not going to believe it until I see Jesus with my own two eyes. In fact, I won't believe it until I touch the scars in His hand and in His side. Lack of faith. Verse 26 of John chapter 20, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered, and he said to him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. So here they are again. Eight days later, they're meeting in a room with the door secured. Uh, all of them except for Thomas had seen Jesus in his risen form. All of them except for Thomas believing that Jesus had risen from the dead. So it's eight days later. What have, they been, what have they been doing for eight days? You know, eight days when you're busy, that can go by pretty quick, right? But what about when your whole life's been turned upside down? They've been living with their master, their leader, their Lord for, for three years. And now he has died and he has risen from the dead. And first they were in mourning and then they were in confusion about the body being gone. And then they rejoiced when Jesus revealed himself to them. And he told them that he was sending them on this mission. And he breathed the Holy Spirit into them. And then what? Why are they sitting around? Why aren't they out there accomplishing their mission? What are they waiting for? They're waiting on the Lord. They're waiting on further instruction. 
They know they've been sent, but they don't have specific orders yet. Waiting on the Lord. Have you ever waited on the Lord? Waiting for anything takes patience, right? In, in our society, things happen fast. We don't have to wait for much. You know, I don't mind waiting for food at the restaurant. They've got to cook it. That takes time. No problem. You know, do it right. Cook it. Great. What I have trouble with is waiting on the bill. I want to be able to leave when I'm ready to leave. It drives me crazy when we're all done, we're ready to go, and the waiter is nowhere to be found. You know, he's out in the back alley taking a break or something. Uh, if I'm at the store and I get tired of waiting in line, I can put the product back on the shelf and I can leave. I'm free to leave. No harm, no foul. But at the restaurant, you can't put the product back on the shelf, not, at least not in the same condition it was given to you, right? Uh, and so it's like I'm being held hostage. You can't leave without being called a thief. So I have to wait until the waiter is ready to mosey on over with the bill. So I was thinking about this. Really, I should be called the waiter because I'm the one waiting. He should be called the mosier. He's moseying on over, right, and taking his time. Well, waiting on God is a little different. It would be more like waiting on hold on the phone maybe. You ever called maybe like the auto parts store? And you ask the person if they've got an alternator for your car, and they say, hey, uh, hold on a second, I need to check on that. Please wait on hold. And so, you know, the music's going, and after 10 or 15 minutes, you get tired of waiting. You think, well, maybe he's forgotten. I don't know. You hang up the phone. And now what happens? The, the guy comes back with the answer, and they can't tell you because you hung up. So you don't get the answer. There was an answer. You just didn't hear it. So maybe you call back in a couple of days, man, I still need that alternator. And hey, the guy says, hey, we just sold the last one yesterday. Guess you should have waited. Have you ever done that with the Lord? You, you know, you get tired of waiting and maybe you just forget about it. Well, I'm not sure what he wants me to do. And two weeks later, you're like, oh, yeah, that, that was that uh, person visiting or something. And, and now they're gone and the opportunity's over. It's passed you by. Or sometimes the other way, uh, you just make a decision and you go for it and you find out you kind of jumped the gun and you made the wrong decision and you got, got out in front of the Lord. So eight days they waited and the Lord returned. Imagine that, right? He didn't, the Lord didn't get lost. And Jesus greets them with peace and he says to Thomas, reach here with your finger. See my hands. Reach here. Put your hand into my side. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas had said, when I see it, I'll believe it. And Jesus showed him, and he believed. Other times, people asked for a sign that they might believe, and no sign was given. You know, God doesn't waste his time. To those that will believe, he shows himself. And to those that won't believe, even if they do see for themselves, maybe he doesn't. He doesn't waste his time. Verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas, after seeing the scars in the hands of Jesus, after touching the scars with his own two hands, he says to Jesus, My Lord. Lord, that means master. Thomas is submitting himself under the authority of Jesus. Submitting himself as a bondservant. A slave by choice. But not only that, then he says to Jesus, my God. Thomas refers to Jesus as his God. Jesus is God in the flesh. One third of the Trinity. God in human form. Thomas probably looking straight into the eyes of Jesus. He says, my Lord, my God. Now if Jesus was not God, as the Mormons and the JWs uh, insist, would not Jesus with his perfect character correct Thomas here and say, you know, whoa, whoa, you, you can call me Lord, but I'm certainly not God. But he doesn't, does he? Jesus allows Thomas to refer to him as God because that's the truth. Jesus responds in verse 29. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. 
Jesus confirms the belief of Thomas, pointing out that Thomas had to see him to believe. Then he pronounces a blessing upon those who believe without seeing. That blessing is upon us, upon me and upon you here this morning. Jesus says you are blessed because you have believed without seeing. You know, often Christians will envy the disciples and imagining ourselves being taught by Jesus, uh, you know, in his physical form, walking along the Sea of Galilee, you know, just hanging out. And that, that would be truly awesome. It would be very incredible. But you know what? We have a blessing the apostles didn't have. Jesus says we are blessed because we have believed without seeing. He continues in verse 30, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. And so here we have the whole reason, the whole purpose of this book, the Gospel of John. This book and the signs recorded in this book were written so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is the one that has been foretold about throughout all human history, starting all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 when God told Satan that the seed of the woman would crush his head. From that far back, these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son, not created, begotten. This book, this Gospel has been written so we can hear the Word of God. And hearing the Word of God, the Word of God causes us to have faith so that we can believe. And when we really believe that Jesus is the Messiah, when we really believe that Jesus is the Savior, when we really believe that God the Father sent him, God the Son, here to accomplish this mission of salvation of, the man, of mankind, then we can believe Jesus when He says, just as the Father has sent Me, I send you. Just as the Father has sent Him on this mission, He is sending us on this mission. And if He's sending us on this mission, He must have specific orders for us. And if He has specific orders for us, how are we going to find out what they are? Just like I won't hear my wife if my eyes are on the TV or if they're on the phone. I need to have my eyes on her if I really want to hear what she has to say. If we're going to hear the Lord, we need to have our eyes on Him. As we're waiting on the Lord, listening to the Lord, well, how do you put your eyes on Jesus? Certainly we can say you can have your spiritual eyes on Him, right? Right? Thinking about Jesus, meditating about Jesus, concentrating about Him. Uh, but how do we put our physical eyes on Him? Can we do that since He's ascended into heaven? Back in the first chapter of John, the very first thing he starts with, he says, in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word of God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He... The Word was in the beginning with God. And then jump down to 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus and the Word of God are one in the same. I know it sounds kind of crazy. One, the Word, of, or let's say Jesus. Jesus is all the attributes of God, of the eternal God, all His attributes are displayed in this human physical body of Jesus. In this human life that He lived, in what He did. All of God was displayed in this physical life. The Bible, the Word of God, is all the attributes of God displayed in perfect written form. You can look at both and see 
God the Father, His eternal thing. You can see it in the Word. You can see it in Jesus and everything that He did and everything that He was about. So how do we put our physical eyes on Jesus? We read Him. We read the Word of God. And certainly we can listen to the Word of God being read and listen to the Word of God being taught. It doesn't have to be our eyes physically on the page. We can listen through the Bible. Hearing. God speaking to us. As we read His Word daily. As we converse to Him in prayer daily. As we fellowship with other believers. And seeing God working in and through those around us. And and He speaks to us in that way too. Encouraging one another. So what's your part in this mission? What's your part? What is God specifically calling you to do at this current time? It may change. It will change. But what part does God specifically have for you to play in this mission of the salvation of mankind right now? If you don't know, if you're not sure, have you really been waiting on the Lord? Are you really listening? Are you really looking with your eyes on Him? With your eyes on His Word? Are you really willing to follow that direction if He does tell you? You know, just as Jesus didn't waste His time showing the Pharisees another sign, knowing that they're not going to believe anyway, He's probably not going to waste His time giving us specific orders if He knows we're not going to follow them anyway. So are we willing? If we're willing, are we waiting on the Lord? Are we listening to the Lord? And then are we obeying the Lord? Really waiting. Really waiting. With our eyes on Him. Really listening. Searching for that direction. Searching for that answer. Not, not uh, like at work when you see the boss coming and you run the other way so you don't get the direction. Are we, are we pursuing that direction? And then when we get it, are we really obeying? Are we willing to, to step up and do it knowing that we're not qualified, knowing that it's going to be scary, knowing that it's going to be beyond our own means? Because that's the way He works. But knowing He's going to provide that way. He's going to provide the the resources we need to do it. Really waiting, really listening, really obeying. There's nothing like it. It's our mission. That's our purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for being our God. We thank You for calling us on this mission, sending us out. Lord, we don't know why You want to use us. Uh, It doesn't make sense. You could do such a better job. You and your angels, uh, but Lord, you want to use us. You've worked it out that way. That's your plan. And so, Lord, help us uh, to recognize that. Help us to be willing, Lord, to follow your direction. Help us to be listening each and every moment. Lord, who is it that you would have us to speak to? Lord, we're not all called to be Billy Graham, you haven't called us all to speak to masses. You've called us all to play a part. And all those little parts working together are huge. And so, Lord, help us to fulfill that little part that you've called us to. Help us to be listening to you. Lord, we need your help. We can't even listen to you without your help. We need your help to listen to you. We need your help to to hear what you're saying, to comprehend it. And Lord, we need your help to do it, to accomplish the task, to allow you to work through us. And so give us that help this morning, Lord. Help us. Give us the desire to be used by you. And Lord, just do a mighty work through us for your name, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.